So we're going to talk in this video about bacterial transformation. This is investigation eight. We're going to walk you through some of the theory of the lab, and then we're going to walk through the procedures as well. So how do bacteria have their DNA? Recall that they have it in two basic forms. Uh, most of their DNA exists in the very large circular chromosome um, with most of its genes. Um, but it also has some DNA and genes outside of the main chromosome in small little circles called plasmids. Remember that the purpose of plasmids is that it perhaps allows these bacteria to pass copies along to other bacteria in their population called conjugation. We're actually going to be doing transformation in this lab though because we're going to take artificial genetically engineered plasmids and try and get the bacteria to directly take them up from their outside environment. So how did the bacterial, uh, uh, how did we make a, a genetically engineered bacterial plasmid to begin with? Uh, the biological supply company is just going to give us theirs, um, but let's just talk about the basic theory about how they might have created it. Um, they need to, first of all, use restriction enzymes to cut the gene out of the source that we want um, to get those genes from. So whatever organism naturally has those genes, we're going to cut them with restriction enzymes. And they need to be restriction enzymes that make sticky ends, because then when we cut the plasmid itself with that same restriction enzyme, um, we have a chance to mix them together, and if they both have the same sticky ends, then they might have a chance of um, meeting each other and attracting each other. And then if we simply add DNA ligase, um, the sugar and phosphate backbone will be glued together so that these genes, which formerly were not a part of this plasmid, now are. So um, we ordered this um, plasmid from the company. We, um, in this particular lab, we use the, the pea green plasmid. Um, and it has two genes in it, uh, the gene for ampicillin antibiotic resistance. So this will enable, enable the bacteria that do transform to survive in an environment with ampicillin. Um, this is often used in bacterial genetic engineering um, experiments because it enables them to separate the bacteria that transform from the bacteria that don't. Um, sometimes called an antibiotic screen, because bacteria uh, will die if they don't get the plasmid with this gene in it. We're also going to see that we can use a color marker as a way of demonstrating transformation. So they should also express a gene that makes them green in color as opposed to the usual white. All right, so this lab, if we're not going to create the plasmid ourselves, this lab is really about just working through the techniques to try and maximize success of transformation. So really, this lab contains three um, uh, uh, chances, uh, three techniques that we're using to try and maximize success. Um, we're going to load some calcium outside the cells. Um, one of the first steps involves loading calcium chloride. I don't know exactly what the calcium does that increases transformation success. Uh, one hypothesis I've seen is that perhaps the bacteria bring calcium kind of close to the outside of their cells, and maybe the positive calcium attracts the overall negatively charged DNA. Recall that the phosphate groups in the backbone make it very negative. Um, we're also going to heat shock the bacteria, so we're going to make them very cold um, at first. We're going to kind of put them in a warm but not hot environment. 42 is pretty far away from boiling. Um, perhaps the heat kind of weakens their membrane is one theory of what this does to help uh, make the, the DNA come in more easily. And then we really need to um, very quickly put them back on ice so that perhaps the membrane kind of solidifies again and doesn't let the DNA right back out. So heat shock. And then um, finally, we want to use the right kind of bacteria. So we call this um, competency. Um, competency here refers to how often you might transform. Um, and if you get a starter plate that looks like this when you come into lab, um, the temptation is to use the bacteria um, up here because there's just so much more of this white, right? So you figure the more bacteria, um, at least I'll be um, successful with some of them. Um, but as it turns out, you actually want to use the little colonies that are separate and individual because those represent bacteria that are still in the exponential growth phase. Um, and so um, uh, for whatever reason, those bacteria are more competent than the bacteria who are already at carrying capacity and are sort of crammed with neighbors already. Um, so we're going to use the colonies. You're going to have two, two samples, and ultimately you want to add one colony to each sample. 
Um, so the next part of the video, I'm just going to um, narrate some video of myself running through some of the materials and procedures of this lab. So let's introduce you to some of the materials that are in this lab. You'll have a big starter plate with bacteria. You'll have four plates that are free of bacteria that will be your test plates. The plasmid is in that little thin tube. You've got sterile glass beads and sterile chemicals, calcium chloride, and the yellow chemical is the Luria broth. You've got a disposal container, and you've got lots of sterile equipment pre-wrapped, pipettes and sterile loops. Um, you've also got soap and bleach um, to disinfect later. So you're going to start by taking some calcium chloride and adding them to your tubes. I'm actually going to come around with calcium chloride to save pipettes. Um, so your, your little tubes will have some liquid in them, and then you'll be ready to take your starter plates and use one of your sterile loops to pick up just a colony of the bacteria, and you want to add them to that microcentrifuge tube with the liquid in it. Um, how do you make sure the bacteria get in that tube with the liquid? You want to twist the loop a little bit to make sure it dislodges. You can also shake the tube to make sure it kind of washes the, the loop. Um, when you're done with the loop, put it in your disposal container. Do not put it in just on the table. You want to make sure that it stays in that disposal container. You're also going to use your second loop to get another colony. You just want to scrape the surface of the agar. Um, don't, don't gouge it and, and punch into the agar and you're just going to add the bacteria to the other tube. Again, twist to make sure the bacteria falls off. You should see a little clump of white um, in the tube. Um, and throw your loop into the disposal container. Then you're ready to use your first sterile pipette. This st sterile pipette is basically just going to be used to draw up um, and kind of push out the liquid constantly. You're just trying to mix the bacteria and the calcium chloride liquid together. Um, if you see clumps of white in your container still, you need to mix some more because you're not done yet. Um, and you need to do this with both tubes. You can actually use the same pipette for both tubes because we haven't done anything to them differently yet. So then you are ready to use your third loop to add the plasmid to the plus plasmid tube only. So how much is 10 microliters of liquid? That's like one loopful. You're just going to dip it into the plasmid container that I'll bring you. Um, and you want to check to make sure it like has a little film of liquid over the loop. That means you have 10 microliters, and you're going to twist it in there, once again shaking the tube to make sure it washes the loop and that you get all the liquid out of it. Shake your tube to make sure that it's in there. Um, and obviously you're only doing that with the plus plasmid group. All right, then you're ready to take both of your um, uh, experimental groups and put them into ice for 10 minutes. This is part of the heat shock part of the experiment. Um, so after you put them on ice for 10 minutes and they're really cold, um, you come to the back of the classroom. This is the, the warm water bath. Um, and you can put them in a little tray like so and put them in the hot water bath for 50 seconds exactly. And you even want to move the tray around like this to make sure that they're constantly exposed to 42 um, degree water. Um, this is part of the heat shock. When if 50 seconds exactly have elapsed, you don't want to dawdle here. You need to put them right back on ice. Otherwise, it's not a heat shock. It's a heat mild surprise. Okay, um, so then you are um, ready to add your Luria broth. I, once again, will come around with the Luria broth when your group is ready. Um, and I'll come around with one pipette so that we save pipettes. And I'm just going to add 250 microliters of Luria broth to each of the tubes. You can kind of mix them around. This doesn't help them transform. This just gives them enough food so that they grow really fast. We're going to be able to hopefully see results just the very next day um, by giving them enough food to grow quickly. Okay, um, and then finally we're ready to add the um, sum of our bacteria to each of our plates. So you're just going to take 100 microliters, which is a very small amount, um, just kind of to the tip of your pipette, and you're going to place it on each of the plates. Um, remember that the minus plasmids um, go on the minus plasmid plates, so be careful there and, and watch carefully. Um, you're going to mix them around by getting a beaker with sterile glass beads, and you just want to pour a few of the beads into the plate like so. Um, and then you can just kind of roll the beads around like I'm doing here just so that it kind of gets bacteria all around the plate. You don't keep the glass beads in there though. Make sure to dump them in your disposal container. Then you can uh, put the cap back on um, and let them sit for a few minutes so that they settle into the agar. This will be your disposal container with all of the loops, pipettes, glass beads, and microcentrifuge tubes once you're done with them. And then last but not least, you need to wash your hands. This is extremely important to be lab safe. 
You need to generate friction by rubbing your hands vigorously like so. And you need to wash your hands for 30 full seconds. So how long is 30 full seconds? Well, you could sing happy birthday to yourself. Um, the happy birthday song lasts about 30 seconds. Happy birthday, Mr. Blyer. Happy birthday to me. You're also welcome to sing it in your head if you'd like. 